Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the Robotics Colloquium. It's my pleasure today to welcome Ani Kim Havi from um, AI2, not very far. Uh, so Ani is a senior director there of computer vision, but his team and his general research interest is a bit wider, including computer vision, natural language processing, and more recently, robotics. Um, and Annie got his PhD from University of Maryland, uh, College Park, and spent five years at Microsoft before AI2. Um, and I had the privilege of getting a tour of um, Annie's lab with the uh, stretch robots there, as well as demos from the different team members. It was really fun. Uh, I hope you all had a chance to meet with him. And uh, he said he really likes to come to campus. Hopefully we can give him more excuses to come and start collaborations. And I'm excited to hear what he has today. Thank you for the kind introduction, Maya. Um, <clears throat> thank you all for coming. Um, so today I'm going to talk about scaling up to build generalizable robots. Data has been a key driver of some of the amazing models that have come out um, in our field over the last few years. And across the spectrum, whether you're talking about language models, code generation, image generation models, even you know, text to 3D models that are coming out over the last few months, one thing has been common, and it's that they're all consuming an immense amount of data. And this appetite for data um, does not seem to be saturating. So if you look at the loss curves for LAMA, which is a language model, or Unified IO, which is our uh, vision and language model at AI2, um, you can see that these training losses continue to go down. And mind you, this isn't overfitting because the total number of training tokens that these models have access to is much larger than the amount that they currently consume. And so across the spectrum, there seems to be um, a theme emerging, which is given very large volumes of data, but not just any data, but high quality and diverse data, um, very clean and simple models, simple model architectures when trained end-to-end -end with supervision learning, with supervised learning, produce robust and generalizable systems. So what's the equivalent in robotics? So uh, many of us in the field, including I'm sure many of you in the audience, have been thinking about this problem. How do we generate a lot of data to do learning in robotics? And the last one or two years has seen many, many papers trying to you know, bring together large amounts of data. So here are just two, um, uh, two snapshots, uh, indicative snapshots that I'm sure uh, many of you have already read. One is Robotics Transformer, which collects a lot of data in the real world through teleoperation. And then, of course, there's this huge uh, effort to bring together data sets from different research labs in universities called OpenX Embodiment. A lot of the data that such papers or such uh, groups have been collecting is data in the real world. And data in the real world, although it is um, extremely powerful, is very difficult to scale. So for example, the robotics transformer was trained on 17 months of data with 13 robots, with people operating these robots nonstop, you know, presumably eight hours a day. That's a lot of money. And the data that uh, we've been talking about in robotics still pales in comparison to the data that you know, some of these language models and vision models have been consuming. I think simulation is the key to scaling up data to the levels at which we see language models being trained on. And at AI2, we've been uh, developing our simulator for about seven or eight years now. This isn't a new theme. This is a theme that is, you know, that is being pursued by many, many robotics research labs out there. But in spite of simulation, you know, having this grand promise of infinite data uh, with uh, no cost, it hasn't really kept its promises, right? And I think there are several reasons why. One is, even though simulators can theoretically scale up data a lot, the number of environments is very, very limited. Um, if you talk about objects that, uh, simulate, uh, that simulators have access to, the object diversity is also very, very small. Then, of course, there's the age-old problem of being physically unrealistic, visually distant, et cetera. And another problem that I see is that a lot of the work that has happened consuming simulators, including a lot of work that we've been working on, 
has used reinforcement learning. Um, this might be an unpopular opinion in this room, but I find reinforcement learning um, extremely slow, um, sample inefficient, um, and very, very difficult to scale as you go to long horizon tasks. So in today's talk, I'm going to present some of the work we've been doing over the last year, year and a half, to try to overcome some of these challenges. Um, and I want to give you a, a, a bit of a teaser. So we've been able to train an agent, which we've named Spock, um, completely in simulation. But this time, we have really, really increased the amount of data that the model has access to. More scenes, and importantly, more diversity. There is no real-world adaptation, so the model has never seen any real-world data. Um, Spock uses only RGB observations. We don't use any depth cameras. We don't use LiDAR. It has a very clean model architecture. There are no sort of uh, moving components. Uh, there's no explicit mapping. Um, it is trained with imitation learning, uh, but there's no human data, and there's no reinforcement learning. And under these circumstances, we've found that Spock is, uh, it does reasonably well in the real world at navigation and some manipulation tasks. So as a teaser, here is our agent in an apartment that we have next to the office. And you can see that the agent has learned to explore its environment. It goes into different rooms. It's been asked to fetch a mug. And it goes there, and it tries multiple times. And eventually, it's able to pick up a mug. So in this talk, I'm going to focus on four parts. The first three are dealing with how were we able to scale. So how do we scale scenes? How do we scale objects? How do we scale data? And the last part of the talk is going to talk about what do we get as a result of the scaling, and what has helped and what has not helped this process. So let me start with scaling up scenes and a quick glimpse into something that we did about 18 months ago. So simulators are typically designed in a very, very resource intensive way. You have some gaming designers or graphic artists sitting and designing these scenes. And this is kind of an unrealistic expectation. Um, where we're expecting to train on maybe 20 scenes, and what we really care about is generalizing to new scenes. And this kind of reminds me of the, you know, the years I spent in grad school where we had a little bit of data in computer vision. We were expecting it to generalize, and it absolutely did not work. Um, what helped computer vision was scaling up to ImageNet. And of course, even ImageNet is considered small today. You're scaling up to web scale data. So how do we scale up to in the ImageNet of uh, simulation? And so this work that came out about 18 months ago was called PROCTHOR, uh, which stands for Procedural Generation of Environments. So you start with an environment specification, uh, like, such as the one shown here, and then you sequentially um, produce, through procedural generation, a distribution of layouts, a distribution of objects, a distribution of placements, et cetera. Um, and what this allows you to do is go from a handful of scenes to a much, much larger set of diverse apartments that you can train objects in. Um, and what we showed in that work was that scaling up does help. And it allowed us to take agents that were able to navigate a little bit in an unseen environment and uh, hugely improve their performance. But of course, procedural generation, the way we did it, has a couple of uh, limitations. First of all, these procedures were manually written, which means that you know, someone in our team had to sit down and write rules on how these apartments are being built. Um, but scaling this up to creating department stores or creating playgrounds isn't going to work when you're manually writing these. And so what we worked on recently is called Holodeck. So Holodeck is procedural generation of um, simulators using large language models. And using language models has allowed us to um, have our specifications be much richer than we used to do with Proctor. So for example, the, uh, the running example I'm going to use is three professors' offices connected to a long hallway, and the professor in office one is a fan of Star Wars. And the way to do this is to take this natural language uh, instruction or specification and get a large language model to procedurally generate scenes for you, to procedurally generate a layout, find the right objects, place them in the right place. So every step of this process is being guided by a large language model. So I won't go through all the steps here, but I'll give you uh, two quick glimpses. <coughs> Surprisingly, much to my surprise, to be honest, these language models were quite good at designing layouts. 
and they had some notion of, you know, sort of uh, spatial um, um, spatial coordinates. So you could ask it to say, well, design a one bedroom, one bath apartment for a researcher who has two cats, and the language model was able to produce uh, what room should be present, what should their coordinates be, etc. Language models are also very good at co-occurrences. So to know that, well, if you if the person is um, uh, living in a one bed, one bath apartment, here are the furniture items that have to go in that particular room. Here are the materials, here are the textures. If this person is a fan of rock music, here are the posters that should go on the wall. You know, things that you might expect. And so when the language model gives us this information in language, we can then use vision and language models to do retrieval. And so we can retrieve from large asset databases and then start furnishing these environments. But we found that language models, while they're good at telling you what should lie in an apartment and how the apartment should be, uh, should be laid out uh, in terms of rooms, they were not very good at telling you where these objects should lie. And we saw lots of errors with um, objects colliding with each other or a couch being placed next to a wall, but then facing the wall, which doesn't make any sense. No one's going to sit like that. And so the way we overcame this problem was to say, well, we asked the language model, instead of giving us the exact position of objects within an apartment, um, output certain constraints that you want to add. So this worked much better. So the language model is able to say, I'd like a couch and I'd like two lights, one to the left and one to the right. But I won't tell you exactly where they should go. Then, of course, there's other global constraints that are true of any environment. You want to avoid object collisions. You don't want to block doors. You prefer objects to be sort of laid out in a rectangular fashion. And so we can add all of these constraints and do constraint optimization to figure out um, where to place these objects. So when we do this, we start getting very rich environments. You probably can't see this because of the contrast, but you can see that there are three offices they're all connected with this long hallway. Um, they're all offices which are professor's offices, so there's some desk or there's a couch there. And then one of the professors likes Star Wars, so it has placed the right memorabilia. Um, and now you can scale to all kinds of scenes. So we can have arcade rooms designed, we can have garages designed. In fact, we can have all kinds of rooms and environments, um, both indoor um, and some of them outdoor as well. Um, because scaling up with language models allows us to do this. Um, when you scale up, you can now start doing things like zero-shot navigation. So navigate in environments that you've never seen before, um, because you can quickly generate environments, um, and you can fine-tune your model on, that, on those kinds of environments, and then deploy them um, in unseen environments. So this is how we've been thinking about scaling up scenes, is use language models to generate lots of diverse scenes, um, but we still need to populate these scenes with objects. How have we been populating them so far? Well, so far, we've been using small databases, right? So AI2Thor has its own internal database that's been created by our graphic designers. Then there are assets like ShapeNet. Um, these databases contain very, very few objects, and not enough if you want to learn um, generalizable policies. Um, and so last year, we released two very large assets which were web sourced. One was called Objiverse, which had close to a million Creative Commons assets. And then there's Objiverse Excel, which takes this one order of magnitude higher. And these resources are very, very rich. So they have object categories um, that cover, you know, the whole gamut of objects that people are interested in in virtual environments. Um, for example, if you just look at the types of chairs here, you see so many different styles. Sometimes these objects are densely annotated with every little part being annotated, and so you can use all of these annotations to build rich models. Um, so now, when you do procedural generation, um, you used to have scenes um, that look like this one, right? Sort of empty scenes that feel very um, vanilla in certain ways. This certainly doesn't look like my house. This looks like my house. There's like kid stuff thrown around, the microwave is open, there's something in the sink. Um, and you want robots to learn how to navigate and manipulate objects in these kinds of environments. And this is what scaling up asset databases can allow you to do. Um, um, of course, when you have large assets of 3D objects, um, you can also use it um, 
to uh, build generative models that can create new assets for you. And so this is a line of work that we have recently started, which is saying, if I have a text, text description of an object, how do I create an asset using a generative model? And then how do I put that asset into a procedural environment and teach um, a robot to, for example, grasp this object? So now if you have a new object, let's say there's something weird about this um, bottle, you can simply take a few photographs and then put it into simulation and then train um, a robot to grasp it or pour from this bottle, et cetera. Um, so that was about scaling up our um, object libraries. Um, now I'm going to talk about um, scaling data. So as I said, we are interested in um, creating lots and lots of training data that can be used for imitation learning. And for this, we use our simulator. And of course, what a simulator gives you is access to a lot of privileged information that you only have an approximation of in the real world. So a simulator um, not just gives you RGB, but you can get depth, you can get semantic segmentation, you can get the entire map, et cetera. And so we've been using planners, um, which are, in, in a sense, I like to call them privileged planners, to um, obtain um, episodes uh, in order to complete tasks. So in navigation, of course, you can do things like shortest path planners, or you can have exploration planners. Um, you can do similar things in manipulation. And then you can start writing planners for more complex tasks, which are seen aware. Go to the most accessible container, which means the one closest to the ground. Because you have information about the entire scene, you can start writing planners to generate training data for you. Um, in terms of tasks, we're thinking of tasks um, in, um, in, 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 in a structured manner. So the first characteristic that we think of is behavior. So as an example here is object goal navigation. Find me an object of this category. So for example, find me a water bottle or find me a fruit, et cetera. Um, so the example here is find me a toolbox. And you want the behavior of finding an object, and you can specify it using uh, the category or the type. But you can also specify it using affordance. So you can say, well, find me an object or find me a container that can be used to carry tools. So now you can say, well, I can either find a toolbox or I can find a bag that is large enough for carrying tools. Or you can say, don't find me any toolbox, find me this kind of toolbox, right? So in this way, you can start generating large volumes of data for different kinds of uh, variations of tasks. Of tasks. Um, you can do relative attributes saying that find me the largest toolbox because I want to put, I don't know, the biggest hammer I have with me at the moment. Um, then you can expand upon behavior. So you can say one, the first behavior was find me an object. You can have another behavior saying pick up. You can say fetch. You can say go fetch this and place it in a different place. I think you get the idea that you can have a commental explosion of tasks that generate data you can have lots of additional conditions. You can have conditional nav. You can say, if the light is on in the kitchen, um, come and tell me something so that I can switch it off through my cell phone. Right? So you can start generating very, very interesting tasks that you want a robot to perform in the real world. Um, so for, for, uh, for this purpose, we use the stretch robot. Um, as I said, the robot only uses two RGB cameras. So there's one camera here that looks in the direction of motion. And there's a second camera here which looks in the direction of the arm. Um, and we generated data from over 100,000 houses um, that we've uh, produced in simulation. And we've generated roughly 10, plus, um, 10 million plus um, training episodes. Um, so a training episode looks like this. The only inputs are the task. So find a bowl and grab it. Then there's data that we use for imitation learning, which has two cameras. So one is a navigation camera in the direction of motion. And then this is the camera which looks at the arm. And right now, the arm is not outstretched, so you don't see it. And at some point, it goes near the object. Um, and then the arm goes out. And then it grasps the object. Um, and then what you get at every time step is the action that was taken. Um, so now that we have this data, um, how do we train this agent and what do we get? So um, let me tell you a little bit about this model. So at each time step, 
um, our model gets an instruction as input. And as I said, it gets two images. One is the navigation camera, manipulation camera, RGB. Um, these are encoded with pre-trained models. So we get, think of it like uh, you can have like uh, an ImageNet pre-trained model, or you can use one of the latest clip models in order to in encode the two images and the goal. These get uh, embedded into a shared embedding space. Um, and then we use a transformer encoder to create what we call a goal conditioned visual representation. So at each time step, you get one representation, which is goal conditioned. And then you can take this representation and produce this at every time step. Along with, these, with this goal conditioned representation, we also feed in the previous action, which is sampled at the previous time step, as well as um, some sort of temporal encoding. Think of it like positional encoding, of course, across time. Um, and then a transformer decoder um, with a causal mask is able to predict actions that the robot must take in order to um, imitate the training data. Um, <clears throat> this sort of factorized approach to creating a, um, a, a sort of visual embedding, goal conditioned visual embedding at every time step, and then feeding it to this transformer decoder allows us to expand our visual vocabulary. So what we've been able to do um, uh, in subsequent work to Spock is we're starting to explore how we can use pre-trained vision and language models internet scale in order to be able to expand uh, the vocabulary of objects that uh, it can understand and it can recognize. Then of course there's another training challenge which is of long horizons. Some of our episodes are about two or three hundred steps long, which means you have to navigate an object, you have to pick it up, then you have to find another object and then you have to place it. So when you start looking at episodes that are 200, 300, even 1,000 steps long, it's very difficult to train models with large batch sizes on even a reasonable number of GPUs. And so the way we overcome this is to say that we take our imitation learning data, and then we randomly select sliding windows of this data. So this is very similar to how language models are trained. You have a whole book of information. Um, the way you generate a batch of data is you grab a few sentences from this book, uh, you feed in some tokens, and then you predict the next token. And that's the same um, uh, philosophy that we have to generating uh, uh, data that can be fed in with large batch sizes. And then of course at inference time, you can feed in the entire history because it's just a batch size of one. So I wanna uh, show you um, the results that we got with Spock, but I wanna start with uh, what I think is the most interesting experiment and finding. So the first experiment here is set up as follows. So we're trying to train this agent to search for an object given its category, right? So we're saying, go find me an apple. But we are training this agent only on shortest paths. So the kind of training data that we have looks like this. The agent is at position one. We, the privileged planner knows that this apple or whatever this object was, was at position two. We simply compute the shortest path that is possible without any collision, and the agent takes the shortest path, and this is the kind of training data that is used to train the agent. And we trained Spock on 100,000 episodes of shortest path. And interestingly, when we take this agent into a new house and we ask it to search for uh, the same categories of objects, this agent exhibits very interesting behaviors of exploration and even backtracks in certain cases. So this has been a very interesting observation that in a sense surprised us quite a bit. Um, and we find that adding exploration data does not improve the exploration capability of this agent. Um, um, yeah, so I guess, I guess that has been a very interesting finding for us. Okay. Yes, please. Why? Why does it do this? Mm -hmm. um, we have, I mean, at this point, I'm going to hand wave a little bit. No, but like, uh, this is not some like uh, model biological organism, right? Like, this is something that you, you wrote. So. Yes. Okay. Um, so, so I think the, even though we don't have exploration data in training, we have certain, I would say, atomic behaviors that are seen during training. So for example, during training, the model will, the, the, the shortest path will 
often go towards the wall, but not bang into the wall. Then immediately take a left turn and then walk along the wall. Or sometimes it will go through a, a, um, a room that has two doors like this room. It comes in through this door, but has to exit through that door because there was a wall. It could not go through that wall. So certain um, atomic behaviors are seen in training. And my, my understanding is that it is able to sort of copy paste those behaviors at inference time. The other reason I think is that I think this is a this is an outcome of the model um, not fitting its data correctly. So, um, as much as I would, as I would like to say that uh, this agent has uh, is able to have a nice long memory of what it's doing, I think it forgets a lot of what it's doing, and so it takes very local decisions. Okay, I'm here. I just came from here. Where should I go next? I'm going to go there. Or, for example, when it goes into this part and says, I don't see this object, and it has clearly learned a prior saying, if I don't see the apple, I'm not going to say found or done. So it goes there and says, I don't see an apple. I see a wall there. Um, what am I going to do? I'm just going to turn around. So if you break it up into sort of subcomponents of this trajectory, then everything that it has done, it has kind of seen. But it's not, but it's still uh, a very, it's been a, Interesting observation. Okay, because like there's a bunch of theory in hindsight optimization, for example, okay. uh, which says that if you if you train exclusively on exploitation data, then the value gap between that and anything that involves exploration um, can be arbitrarily large. So let me give you a simple example. Um, I have objects on a table. Um, I pick up object one. I pick up object two, I pick up object three, uh, and I see all those objects. Um, but then now the light is off, and what I need to do is switch on the light, and then figure out what object to pick up. Like clearly that's auto distribution, yep. right? so you'll never see it. So, so I guess like something's happening here that, um, you know, to your point, like your bug is a feature yes. in that it's, it's forgetting certain things that Perhaps it is exploiting everywhere, and to us as humans, since we like to anthropomorphize things, it might perhaps appear like exploration. Like yes, I guess, it, like for, it, it, for exploration to emerge out of the exploitation is, like I guess, like technically challenging to believe. But no, perhaps it's an emergent behavior of what you're seeing. No, no, I, I, I don't like to use the word emergent. I don't think any of this is any emergent behavior. Mm -hmm. I think, like you said, it is behavior that is being imitated at much smaller horizons. Um, I don't think there's anything magical happening here, but it is still very interesting to observe. Yes? I know this sounds pretty <coughs> counterintuitive, but have you tried at all like pseudo shortest paths that are not exactly the shortest path? Yeah, so, so when, we, when we trained this experiment, when we trained this model, we were not expecting it to do well. And so we had another planner which said, explore in a certain way until you have in, more than you know, n number of pixels of the object visible, and then do a shortest path because we thought that that would be the natural way to sort of teach this robot how to explore until it sees an object. Um, that doesn't give uh, much better results than this. It's I would say it's within noise. <coughs> okay. Then of course there are, you know, I guess less surprising behaviors given the kind of data that we have. But Spock has learned to. For example, navigate to the highest fruit in the kitchen, highest as in the highest from the ground. And you can see that it goes to one place, finds a fruit, um, then goes to another place until it finds a second fruit, and then determines which one is higher, and then you know, says done at the right location. Um, you can also locate a computer on a sofa. Here it goes to one sofa, does not find uh, any computer, then explores around until it sees a second sofa, and then says done. Of course, SOFA is much easier to locate at a larger distance, and so SOFA is the uh, object it is seeking. Yes? In the previous example, uh, did the agent know that there were only two different fruits in the scene? Um, the training data has often more than two. Okay. Um, here, it seems like it has taken a decision after the second one. Okay. Um, so could be suboptimal behavior, okay. but it uh, worked out in this case. Okay. Um, I, I mean. Uh, I think it also is a, an, another thing that we see a lot in our agents is that um, it learns a prior on what uh, typical episode lengths are, just like any other 
you know, machine learning approach, it's, it's exploiting all sorts of priors in the data. And so it often uh, decides to end early um, without exploring the entire environment as long as it finds some evidence of the truth. Um, so if we train it on episode lengths between 200 and 400 steps, it, um, unless it doesn't find any evidence of the fruit, um, it typically says, well, I found a fruit. It's about 350. I think it, this is probably the right answer. Okay. Um, so in the case where it learns to have higher, longer trajectories, um, although it is trained on shortest paths, um, it never sees that object. And so it has a huge bias against saying done when it doesn't observe that particular object. That's why it leads to longer episodes at test time. Here are some um, videos of it in the real world. So um, as I said, there's one apartment next to AI2 where we do all of our experimentation in the real world. So here it goes to an apple and it picks up this uh, green apple. Um, uh, by the way, these are the observations that are input into the network. Um, here is a place where it looks for a toilet. So it starts in the kitchen, and then it goes out, it goes into the hallway, and then eventually you'll see it um, go into a, a bathroom and then look at the toilet. Um, of course, it's important to note that although all of our test episodes take place in one of two apartments, uh, these apartments are unseen um, at training time. So it goes in there and then it, well, first it collides against the door and then it goes in and it finally says done. Um, and then here is a little bit of a failure case where it tries to pick up a house plant and then it ends up picking up the leaf and um, it could have done better. Uh, the videos, uh, is there a significant inference time? Like, what's the rationale behind the speed up? The inference is actually not very um, slow, but uh, we have a discrete action space, and we find that the robot shakes after taking any action. So we've put in a fair amount of delay in order to like stabilize the robot and then get the next observation and then, then process it through the network and get the next action. So we've been trying to find ways to speed this up, but this tends to provide us the best results at test time, although it infuriates my colleagues. It is 20x, right? Like it's, I guess it's, like it's very it's, slow. It's, uh, it's very, very slow. It's definitely interesting. Yeah. Um, but most of the time is spent in just sort of stabilizing and then taking the photograph. Yes. Uh, is that an issue with the robot, or like, I don't know, do others have this robot? Do they also have to move at 20x? Um, I don't know. Maya, do you have this robot? We're usually about 8x. <laughs> oh, okay. It is slow, but I think it's the, that's the answer, the discrete action space. I think yeah. Yeah, that's what we would do. Yeah. We're, we're, we're trying to get, we have to get past this, otherwise, uh, you know, People well, performing I mean, these experiments. A, I mean, it depends on what you're trying to do, right? These videos are impressive regardless, and speeding it up could be somebody else's problem. Y yes, that's so, not really I mean, that's not the focus of your work. Yes. Yes, Steve. Is there some way to investigate the kind of the memory the model has or uses? Because it seems, for example, let's just say, uh, look for the apple. Yeah. The model could just have learned even from the shortest path data. Apple, okay, I'll first go to the kitchen, and once I swept the whole kitchen, then it says, okay, now let me look at the second best location where I might find apples. But for that, it needs to have this memory to figure out that I've seen the whole kitchen now, which means I should move on. Is there any way to kind of extract some information about that from the model? Well, we, because we, if we had an explicit mapping component, then we'd ha be able to draw some inferences. We don't have that. So the only inferences we've been able to draw are looking at a large sample of test cases. So to say, well, typically, what does it do? And we do see that it relies on co-occurrences. So uh, the procedural generation of these scenes isn't completely random with objects. Each object uh, 
has some prior on where it, where it uh, occurs, and we see that the robot will often go to the kitchen if it needs to look for that object. The counter example was where it spent more time than it should in that kitchen when it was looking for the toilet. So there, I would have expected that it just turned around and said, there cannot be a toilet in this kitchen. Uh, but it, it's not that smart. <clears throat> OK, so what matters and what matters less? So one thing that we definitely see is that um, when we're training for object navigation, so this is where it's only trained on shortest path, we notice that the scale of data definitely matters. So when we train on 1,000 training episodes, um, it performs very poorly. And when we train on 100,000 episodes, it starts performing much better. So scale definitely matters. Um, but what also matters is the diversity of houses. So here we have two extremes in this graph, which is the number of scenes that we used to train on in the past and the number of scenes that we're training on now. And the volume of the data is the same. So here you have many different starting locations and ending locations in the same layout. And here you have many more layouts. And there's a roughly 10 to 15 point gap um, uh, in the performance. Um, another thing that matters is context length. So when you train with longer context lengths, you start seeing that the model performs better at inference time. Of course, the longer the context length, the smaller the batch size. And so when you go to context lengths beyond 200, the batch size is so small that your gradient updates aren't good enough for the model to learn effectively. So we start seeing that context lengths beyond this start saturating and sometimes even drop. Um, of course, if you had you know, many, many more GPUs, I think you could probably squeeze out a little bit more juice um, at longer window sizes. Um, he, here's another interesting thing. We found that as the visual encoder got better, um, we found that uh, the model was able to navigate around its environment much better, presumably because it could, I don't know, in a sense, trust its features better. So we use a frozen visual encoder. Um, so that it can transfer to the real world. We do not want to learn visual features from uh, AI to Thor. But as we went to um, better visual encoders, you can see a non-trivial increase in performance. Um, so this is what we used to use in the past. It's a clip encoder with a ResNet 50. And this is a new encoder that came out of uh, Google research, I would say a year ago. And the SIGLIP encoder showed that on 38 different benchmarks, they did much better than um, you know, some other sort of ResNet 50 uh, trained clip style. And so we started using SIGLIP, and we saw a huge bump. Dino is another encoder which also uh, does reasonably well. And we also see the same trend when we measure performance in the real world. Um, what matters less is the architecture. So we chose to use this sort of transformer encoder decoder. It felt very natural. It felt very 2023, um, but we found that if you remove this transformer decoder and put a GRU, or you do not use a transformer encoder and you just sort of you know, use uh, pooling uh, and concatenate features together, it still works as well. So the architecture of the model doesn't seem to matter as much. Um, um, this was a very interesting finding that I was just talking about is, um, so purple is the performance of our model, and red is the performance when we train and evaluate it um, with uh, ground truth target detection. So we're not providing ground truth information for the entire scene, we're not providing depth, but we just provide the coordinates of the object uh, when it is visible in the, any of the cameras. So if you're looking for an apple, when I see some apple, I will give you the coordinates. And we find that, for example, if you look at object navigation, we find that the performance goes up to almost 85%. Both on, you know, we have a small benchmark and a large benchmark. Both of them, the performance goes to 85%. You see, when you're looking for an object in a scene, most of the work is about exploration. So it's about, like, you have to explore around, and then the last mile is where, oh, I see the apple, I'm just going to go straight for it. Yes? 
But when you say coordinates, it's not, let's say, bounding box coordinates, but it's like in the 2D space? No, it's just bounding box coordinates bounding on the image plane. Okay. Yeah, it's a running an object detector, but a perfect object detector, right? So what this suggests is that the model is able to navigate and explore the environment very effectively, and it almost always comes close to the target object. See, if it never came close to the target object, we would never give the bounding box and it would never succeed. So it's always done enough exploration to get to the target object, but it's the final mile of object detection which is causing a huge drop in accuracy. And we see this both in SIM and the real world. Um, and then here are results in the real world, and to sort of, you know, these numbers you know, don't mean much by themselves. Um, so to put this into context, here are um, the equivalent performances in simulation. So you can see that the numbers that we get in the real world, although they are much smaller sample size, are in the ballparks of what we are getting in simulation. A notable exception is pickup. And I'll, this is a very sort of a quirk of our design as to why this drop in performance. So when we designed this task in simulation, we had fetch and we had pickup. Fetch meant that you had to navigate to the object and then pick it up. Whereas when we did pickup in simulation, we said you're already at the ideal location for pickup. All you have to do is move your arm and pick up the object. But in the real world, you know, the person placing the robot for pickup doesn't know exactly the XY coordinate. And so the robot needs to always have to sort of navigate around and then pick up. Um, and so, but it hasn't learned that when it sees the word pickup, it needs to navigate. And that's why we see this sort of synthetic, I, I call it a synthetic drop in performance. But across the board, we see that the model is transferring really well. Um, one of the reasons it transfers well without any adaptation is that we do a lot of data augmentation at training time. And without data augmentation and without like jittering the colors and all of those blurring the image, um, a sim to real um, a gap does exist. Um, so now recently we've started to think about how we can use the sort of scaled up paradigm of data to perform um, more interesting tasks. Um, and so I won't go into details here, but we're working on um, how to use this paradigm to sort of open doors. Um, you can see the manipulation camera here um, has a little rope attached, so it has to sort of pull the rope in order to open the door. Um, and we're also working on um, how do you perform tasks like cleaning a table. So we're trying to take this and scale it beyond uh, picking up and placing objects. Um, okay, I have a few minutes left. So I'm going to take this time to talk about how we can use scale and use simulation, not just to build generalizable robots, but also to, in a sense, specialize them or customize them. So when I talk about um, specialization or customization, um, I'm referring to how do you get it to specialize to a certain environment um, to extract a little bit more uh, success rate, uh, and also how do you get it to specialize to certain kinds of behaviors that you may be interested in. So let me start with environment. So if I take a step back, um, this is where we were a couple of years ago in our research. Is we had some training rooms and we had some test rooms in simulation, um, and we expected models to generalize, which they did not. So what we've done in this work is to say, well, let me just expand the amount of data. And when I expand it, I start getting smaller gaps um, and easier generalization, often leading to more robust models. But you know, in the real world, um, what I care about is my house. I want to go to Best Buy. I want to buy the robot that you, know, that you have built. And I want it to work in my house. I don't really care about it generalizing to all of your houses, but I really care if it fails in my house. And so ideally what I'd like to do is fine tune this policy um, on a set of houses in simulation that resemble my house. And if I do this, I expect that once again, the generalization gap is small and I should be able to squeeze some extra performance. And this is what we call phone to proc. So in phone to proc, um, you pick up your phone and you start scanning your environment um, and you transfer it to the real world, to simulation. But you're not transferring um, one instance of the environment, but instead you're able to generate a distribution 
around um, your house. So you can jitter the size of the rooms a little bit, or more importantly, you can jitter the lighting conditions, you can jitter what objects are present, etc. And so now you have a much tighter distribution that you can train on in simulation, and then you can deploy uh, this policy onto your real robot. Um, and so, for example, here is a video of someone taking their cell phone and scanning this room. Um, and here is the environment that, one of the environments that uh, we sample from this distribution. And as you can see, it has got a few things wrong, but most things fairly right. And this is using, uh, you know, the latest and greatest in computer vision. Um, and so now, um, if we take this model and test it in five different apartments, you can see that, sorry, you can see that uh, performance improves. So this is work prior to Spock. Um, and so we don't have our sort of latest and greatest object nav models in here, but we do see that customization can help. But it's interesting. Um, it's not just taking your house and putting it into simulation. It is putting variations of your house. And that allows this phone to proc agent to be robust to change in lighting, um, robust to change in the location of the target, furniture rearrangement. These are all things that if you simply reconstructed your exact environment in simulation, you would just overfit to that single reconstruction and it would start failing. Um, similarly, it would fail if there is clutter, it would fail if people are moving around because it has sort of overfit to one environment. But when you do phone to proc, um, uh, you see uh, that the model is much more robust. Um, and finally, last couple of slides is about um, specializing behaviors. So let's say that you've trained a robot for a simple task like find my keys or um, you know, unload a dishwasher or you know, clean the table. Um, you might want to customize the robot's behavior. So you might want to provide some demonstrations of how to behave in your house. Or you might say, well, my kids are asleep, and so can you please be a bit quiet? Or you might say, um, well, what you did yesterday wasn't something that I like in this house and what you did the day before was much better. And so you have different kinds of ways by which you might want to give feedback to the robot. But what you don't want to do is you don't want to have to take this feedback and fine tune your model. Um, and so this is a framework that um, we've been working on called promptable behaviors. So at inference time, you want to be able to just speak to your robot and it should customize its behavior for its next episode. So the way, to, the way we have come about a solution is to say, well, this is very similar to what we had before. You had um, an instruction, and you had an image observation, and then you're training this policy. Um, by the way, this is not imitation learning. This is with reinforcement learning. Um, and so you have different uh, reward weights and sub-rewards. These sub-rewards can be things like safety, which means if you collide, you get a negative reward. It could be efficiency, which means if you take an extra step, you get a negative reward. It could be a positive reward for exploration, et cetera. And then you can have a weight for each of these sub-rewards and combine these to um, get your final reward. You use this reward in order to train your agent with reinforcement learning, but you also feed in these reward weights as an input to the system. And then as you randomize these reward weights at training time, you can sort of have a policy um, that can take an action conditioned on these reward weights. And now what you can do at inference time is take your human preferences, whether it's a demonstration, whether it's a preference feedback, or whether it's a language instruction, and um, either through optimization or through another, uh, or through a learned model, be able to predict what reward weights would have led to that demonstration or that feedback. And so this allows you to speak to your robot and have it uh, you know, exhibit different behaviors. So here's a, a little bit of a trivial example where you're doing, you're finding an object. And if you say, what I really care about is efficiency, then it sort of goes and takes a left turn. It sees the object goes towards it. If you say, I want you to make sure that you explore different parts of the house, it sort of goes around in circles. And if you say safety, it sort of goes around this wall very carefully so that it is very, very far away from um, the walls of your environment. 
Um, and so this is a framework that we've been using to um, prompt the robot to behave differently in different scenarios. Um, and uh, let me summarize or let me conclude. So um, simulation um, you know, holds a lot of promise, but I believe that it is now starting to generate a lot of high quality and diverse data, which is enabling us to train end-to-end -end policies um, with imitation learning, um, RGB sensors alone, um, which has been very sort of satisfying to see, um, to produce generalizable robot policies in the real world. And I think that this paradigm is, we're just scratching the surface, um, but I think there's um, a lot of scaling that can be done in terms of data, in terms of tasks, um, and in terms of performance. Um, and with that, I'll thank a long list of collaborators, and thank you all for listening. Uh, talk more about the failure cases. Is, is it failing like it just goes into a room and says I'm done or how does that usually come about? So we see two kinds of failure cases. One failure case is last mile object detection. So you know object detection has progressed a lot over the last few years but it is still remarkable how it fails in trivial ways um, even for simple categories. So it's that last mile object detection which is a problem. So um, it seems to have false alarms, which means it will say done early. The second thing is that it seems to collide against walls more than I would have liked. Um, this is a little bit of, you know, we're using imitation learning, so it has never seen parts of the state space where it gets extremely close to a wall. So Often it will avoid walls, but sometimes it collides against walls and the episode ends. Um, and so we're thinking about how to use, you know, in language models they've been using sort of RLHF, and so we're thinking about taking this imitation learning policy, running it in um, the real world, uh, or even running it in simulation, getting human feedback, and then sort of adapting it to be a bit safer. That has been very uh, frustrating to see that it just, goes against a wall. So it would like go against a wall enough that like you guys are going to call call the like episode. Yeah. Okay. I mean it's not a lot because you know we are seeing like 50 60% success so it's not like 9 out of 10 it's going against a wall. But it's still um, uh, to me it feels like a failure case which we should be able to avoid fairly easily. So uh, needs a bit of work. Uh yep. Why not incorporate depth information or point clouds? <laughs> so this is a constant source of, uh, let's say, healthy conversation in the office. Um, so um, I guess I'm, well, two reasons. One is just curiosity. I wanted to see how far we can take this with RGB only. Um, I think if we start doing fine-grained Manipulation, we will need depth. Uh, I have no doubt about that. Uh, but I felt that you probably don't need depth when you're doing navigation. and Or rather, you can get away with it. And I wanted to see how much we could get away with it. Uh, and so it was quite interesting to see that it works reasonably well without any depth. The other thing that, other reason why I sort of shied away from depth was we used to use depth in the past, but we saw that the sim to real gap with depth was larger. Um, so, in simulation, you get perfect depth. In the real world, you get very imperfect depth. You get lots of holes in your depth cameras. Depth cameras are lower resolution. So, I felt that if we were to use depth, we'd really need to um, study how to do augmentation on the depth image in order to reduce this gap. Um, whereas, augmentation on the image, on the RGB image, is something that we've been doing for a long time in vision. And so, that's why. Um, we didn't use depth. Okay. Uh, it, it is in our future. Okay. Uh, and, uh, just a quick follow-up. Do you think incorporating depth could help with the collisions? I think, think so. Yeah. I think so. Yes. Can oh, I piggyback? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go. I was going to um, piggyback too. <laughs> <laughs> um, kind of piggyback, piggybacking off of the, the depth question, if you were to, to go to add depth, um, 
would that sim to real gap that you're talking about, would that perhaps be less if you use something like stereo depth instead of LiDAR depth? Um, since that would also be using your RGB images. Um, I'm not sure because it would be still approximating depth from RGB, yeah. um, which, is, which means that you now need to have some sort of a model that runs on your perfect depth in simulation and sort of does image translation to noisy depth. Mm -hmm. So that's how, I would, that's how I would want to do depth correctly, is learn a style transfer from perfect depth to imperfect depth as a depth camera would see it. Um, the, oh yeah, so the other reason why I didn't use depth was, uh, not I, we, we didn't use depth was, um, if we had to change the camera, then I suspected that depth augmentations that we do for one camera may not work for another camera. But I felt that RGB sensors were, you know, have converged to, you know, a lot of cameras give similar kinds of RGB outputs, at least more similar than depth cameras. So that's why I've sort of shied away from depth. But I can tell you for a fact that on a weekly basis, there's a healthy argument in the kitchen. I was yes. just going to say, yeah, Peter and I were discussing just before this of how, like when depth cameras first came, we suddenly could do a lot of things we couldn't do before. Yes. And now there was a lot of new things that were like not like throwing away depth and it felt like we're taking a step back. But I think your intuition is correct that like it's, it's also like some of these things that you're doing uh, of like larger scale on your horizon, like you can't do them with just depth. And it feels like exactly when you get into fine manipulation, that's where it's going to bring most value. Yeah. The other reason is that, so we haven't done it in Spock, but now we're looking at using internet pre-trained vision and language models. All of those models are RGB only. So now if you have to incorporate depth, it has to be through a different part of the transformer as opposed to like sort of doing it at the low level where you say I have four channels, I have R, G, B, D, and I'm just going to like encode this information with language instruction. So because depth hasn't, isn't widely available, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a little, we're trying to be a bit careful about how to use it. Uh, yes? Um, do you have, um, so right now it's a mostly like discrete action space. Yes. Um, do you have like future plans to increase to like continuous action space? Yes. Um, if so, um, do you think like, you know, are you currently going to like same imitation learning um, architecture? Um, like, are there any plans for that? Yeah, so the, 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 the work that I showed you very briefly on cleaning the table was continuous action space. So we are not just future, but we are actively working to move towards continuous action spaces. I think we need to do that to perform more interesting tasks. And I think this paradigm can still work there. We just have to modify our planners a little bit. So um, um, the architecture is like base transformer models are still like big models, um, and then they output continuous action space. Yeah. I mean, you can, um, you can either take a continuous action space and have a, uh, a, a, an autoregressive model, still bucketize it and still use like cross entropy losses, or you can use regression losses to just tell you what the step size should be. Um, I think it's, um, I, I think the paradigm still uh, can be effective. Sorry if this is not that, but uh, for uh, maybe faking that a little bit, uh, did you try to use something like depth anything or a depth estimation model and just use that as the RGBD to feed the model? Yeah, we've been thinking about that is to use depth um, from the simulator at training and then use uh, an off the shelf like monocular depth estimation at testing. So this is something that uh, someone in the team is trying. Just like, you know, we are able to use uh, object detector at training, um, you know, to measure that gap. We used perfect object detection at training and then we also used a real object detector um, at inference time because we can't get perfect object detection in the real world. Um, so similarly, we can also use monocular depth estimation. So yeah, that's something that we're looking at. Um, I think it will still have the same problems as sim to real. By the way, even object detection has sim to real problems. And so the way that we do that for you know, that small set of experiments for that ablation was we just randomized false alarms and uh, you know, false positives and false negatives. But, but ideally, you should have a, maybe a style transfer model.
All right, let's thank Annie one more time. Thank you.